and uh, Rob is going to basically MC the event and and uh, manage the uh, the grilling of Ian. Uh, and I'm leaving it to the two of them as to what sort of event they would like to give us. And um, over to you, Rob. OK, thanks very much, John. And thanks, uh, MK Litfest, for organising this event. A um, number of names I recognise already from the uh, from the screen, from the people entering. Um, as John said, I'm, I'm Rob Gifford. I'm co-curator of Stony Words, the literary festival that happens in Stony at the end of January every year. Um, delighted to welcome Ian. It'd be lovely if we were in the same room, but we'll pretend we are for the purposes of this discussion. Um, I guess many of you know a bit about Ian. He is the editor of politics.co.uk. He's the author of Brexit, What the Hell Happens Now? Um, he's a host on the Romaniacs podcast, and he writes for a variety of newspapers and magazines and appears regularly on TV and radio. And having looked at, uh, having Googled him this afternoon as well, um, I can see that he is uh, an inveterate user of Twitter, um, which I've no doubt we can, we can discuss. Um, this, in case you don't know it, is the book we're here to talk about, um, How to Be a Liberal by Ian Dunst. Thank you, John. Um, and I guess, Ian, the first obvious question is the kind of $64,000 question, which is why this book and why now? Uh, well, I mean, I guess the answer would be look at the state of us. Um, so take the last week, for instance, of politics. I mean, take the, take the speech that David Frost made this week. Okay, now, I mean, the speech that David Frost made didn't have a single proposition in it that he hadn't negated by his own behavior. I have very rarely seen someone stand up and just launch into a description of values which he himself has spent the last two years trying to destabilize and destroy. Take the speech from the Prime Minister um, at the Tory party conference the other week before he went on holiday somewhere, where it was almost impossible to maintain your sanity while listening to the arguments that he made. So he made at the same time the argument, you know, absolutely nothing to do with Brexit, the, the various crises that we're seeing here, but also because of Brexit, everything is going to get better in our response to it. Where this is because, you know, we're changing freedom of movement, we're going to make sure there's fewer people coming here, but at the same time, we're just going to send over these visas over here to try and get more immigrants over. It is classic double think. It is a repeated attempt to hammer away at your capacity to use reason when engaging with political affairs. Now that has been talked about through the history of liberalism, the crucial aspect of truth, of empirical truth and of reason in politics and the dangers that are posed when you allow objective truth to fall away, the power that it hands to the executive, the power that it hands to the authorities. That is one small part of the liberal story but in each part of the liberal story, you see the after effects of its decline daily in the way that our politics takes place. The absence of truth, the use of tribalism, the emphasis on emotion over reason, the attacks on the separation of powers, the um, belittling of the concept of moderation in exchange for complete tribal victory and a messianic pursuit towards politics. So the reason that you write the book right now is because our society is degraded by the rejection of liberalism and it's only by turning to liberalism that we can repair the damage that's been done i mean i'm glad you in in that answer that you talked about the power of emotion over reason um because i was reminded earlier this week of um well, it was in an article actually by john harris in the guardian on monday um but he, he referred to the American psychologist and, polit and political consultant, Drew Weston, whose work I, I must admit, I don't particularly know, but Weston published The Political Brain, um, which was a book about the predicament of the US liberal left, as he called it. Um, and there was a quote which John Harris used, which is, when reason and emotion collide, emotion invariably wins. And the problem, I think that, you know, that's the liberal left. And I know in the book, you don't necessarily associate liberal and left all the time. And I want to come on to that later on. Um, but that liberals and leftists tend to be unduly fixated with policy debates, arguments and statistics. Um, do you think that's part of the problem of being a liberal as well? 
<laughs> it's important to be fixated on these things. It's important to try and understand the world as it functions and to propose policies that can repair it as it actually is, rather than as we want it to be. So I think the problem is slightly different to the one that you were describing. I think it's that um, liberals became seduced really from the fall of the Berlin Wall, I think, by the idea of a direction of history. This idea that, you know, history was just going in our direction. The world would gradually become more free, more progressive, more tolerant, more accepting. And um, it's oddly, it's a similar thing that happened to, to liberals in the Victorian period, where they presumed exactly the same thing. And that dream didn't really come crashing down until the First World War, where they suddenly realized the same thing that we're realizing now in a rather less macabre and catastrophic way. Which is that history just has no direction. It has none at all. History is what you make it. You have to fight for your values. They do not progress as if it's gravity weighing down on the earth. You have to be able to articulate them and you have to fight for them. So what happened, I think, during that period, the sort of post Berlin Wall period, was really that liberals engaged in political debate predominantly kind of behind the scenes. So they would fight human rights cases in court, in international courts and in domestic courts. They would push for the case in business, for instance, on immigration, in business lobbying or in the civil service. But where politics really happens in the street, in the pub, by the water cooler in the office, the actual live debates that humans have, you very rarely heard liberals kind of make the case for immigration, for international institutions, for human rights. Actually, that was largely unheard. And who was heard? You know, I was working as a junior journalist during this period. If you wanted to talk to Nigel Farage, you could speak to him at any time. You have the phone number. Every journalist had the phone number. You dial it before it even rang once. You'd have Farage picking it up and he'd be speaking in perfect, you know, everything he said was pure poison. But he'd be speaking very cogent, uh, very understandable language, referring to concrete objects, not to highfalutin sort of legal structures or institutional rules. And these are the people that were making the case. They were making it in TV studios, in radio studios, in offices, in homes, in pubs. So I think the problem wasn't so much that you get too fixated on policy. Policy matters. You know, data, evidence, all these things matter. Institutions matter. It's that you cannot forsake the politics, the day-to-day -day political discussion. And that's one of the things that I think has changed since 2016, since that double whammy of Brexit and Trump, which really knocked liberals for six, as they suddenly realized, well, no, I mean, now it feels like history is against me, like we're the barbarians at the gate. So now I must be able to articulate my values. I must be able to make the case myself. I think that's a very important point. I mean, I think you, you made a very important point there about language. Um, and certainly you're absolutely right. You know, the, the Farages of this world, the Trumps of this world, managed to use a demotic language rather than the kind of managerial language of, of liberalism. Um, I mean, uh, you know, the Blair government's line about what matters is what works, which led to, I think, uh, a, a, fo a, a focus on managerial approaches to politics, mm. um, whereas the populist tries to use words that will sound an echo, if you like, in people's minds. Do you have any thoughts about how liberals could use the right language then to press the right buttons in that direction? I mean, the funny thing is that for, I completely agree with your analysis of Blairism, but the funny thing is they still knew how to talk. Right? When it came to the public facing bit, you take something like, you know, tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. It's readily understandable. It communicates to different audiences to left and right. You know, we'll be tough on the criminals, but we'll deal with sort of systematic disadvantages that lead people in, you know, all of that. They knew how to speak clearly. Um, there's a, that, and that got lost. I mean, I think you can see how badly it got lost. And if you look at the Labour conference a couple of weeks back, they had a slogan on the stage. It would help. Actually, you know what? In a way, it makes my point better by virtue of the fact that I can't remember what that slogan was. It was something like better together in future or something like Strong, that. I think it was stronger future together. Beauty. That is exactly what it was. No, I think that's that's that's... If it, if it wasn't that, it was very close to that. It was just this kind of technocratic, meaningless babble that sort of passes through the brain without really impacting on the heart or the, or the mind. Um, the Tory slogan behind their thing was getting the job done. Okay? So what's the difference? That you, you're talking in a phrase that can be readily understood that refers to concrete words. And I think that the key behind that it helps, there's an old Newsnight interview with Boris Johnson, 
um, I think it's Evan Davies on Newsnight, it's about six, seven years ago. And he doesn't try to attack Johnson. Instead, he tries to find out what it is that he's good at. And he does it by asking him about um, the Churchill speech, we'll fight them on the beaches. And actually, Johnson, suddenly you actually get a sense of uh, sort of a, a kind of real person there. It's quite rare that you can see the real person in the artifice that is our prime minister. But you could for a moment there. And what he understood and pointed out very well was, look, they're all Anglo-Saxon words. They're all readily comprehensible words. There's no abstraction. Why does this speech work? Because of the manner in which it's written. Like that skill really is lacking and not just in the sort of mainstream party political left, but in the radical left. When you look at campaign groups, there's really very little skill on communication, very little skill on language. So over and over, you do see this same problem take part. That's not really a, a fundamental problem with values. It's to do with skills, but it's one that we urgently need to adopt. You you spend, I think, quite a lot of the book uh, in one of my favourite periods in the 17th century. Mm. Um, and I think this oh, links right. up to a number of, of strands of, of, of your previous answers. A sense of history, a sense of using words for the right meaning. Um, and actually, of course, you know, the, the, the levellers in the... 17th century, the, the radical left of the 17th century uh, used to complain about the Norman yoke and wanting to go back to the Anglo-Saxon period, as I recall. <laughs> so, you know, I'll pick up your Anglo-Saxon reference there. Um, so there's a lot in there about the English Civil War and about the kind of period of really radical dynamic change that was going on there and, and change in political theory as well. Um, I mean, am I right? What, what for you is so important about the period 1640 to 1660? Hmm. I mean, for a start, there's two moments in it, really, that I think are crucial. First one um, really comes with Overton. You know, Overton is um, uh, he's a radical pamphleteer. He owns his own printing press. At that point, printing presses are pretty much banned. Firstly, by, you know, Lord, basically by the king, essentially. Um, and then later on by the Presbyterians in Parliament. So you get this kind of renegade printing press set up. You know, Overton, he's a very, he's, a, he's sort of a sketch writer and a kind of columnist, pamphleteer, very, very radical. Um, and he's eventually, he gets woken up at night, he gets dragged to a jail cell. And in a jail cell, he writes sort of an arrow against all tyrants. And an arrow against all tyrants is really one of the first times in history that you get a proper expression of individual rights, of the freedom of the individual what would later turn into what we now really call human rights. And it's I am free up until the point that I affect someone else's freedom. One of the most, a, a thought that now we, we talk about so much that it seems, you know, kind of not really worth noticing, but is in fact a truly beautiful idea, which evolves with ever greater degrees of complexity the more that you apply it. And that is a crucial moment in political history and one we don't talk about enough. The second comes during the Putney debate. The Putney debates are a moment where the levellers working with the army have essentially sort of captured the king. They're at war against their own parliament and they're in a kind of mutiny against their own officers. And in the midst of this scenario, they have an extremely sophisticated debate on political theory, which is sort of summoned up really by uh, Colonel Thomas Rainsborough, um, which I don't, if I try and I'm, I'm gonna, I might try and do this verbatim, and I think I'm going to cock it up. Let's see how far, let's see how far I get. I mean, the, the quote is something like, you know, the poorest he that is in England hath a life to live as the greatest he, and therefore, truly, sir, I think it's clear that no man ought to live under a government unless he has, by his own consent, put himself under that government. Now, that is an absolutely that, that is an expression. You know, in this period of proto-liberalism, that is an expression of something very, very close to pure liberal theory erupting out of the past. We're talking, you know, 150 years really before the French Revolution, before the, the period that we start thinking of as the triumph of liberalism. Um, so it's crucial for those reasons. I also think it's just genuinely a good thing to talk about the English Civil War, that in this country, astonishingly, we just don't talk about it very much, but it's a period of shocking radicalism, of very, very mature, modern political thought emerging from the past. And it, to me, it's, it's astonishing to me, you know, given that A, we talk about the Glorious Revolution, which is frankly much less interesting, much less radical. And B, how much the Americans talk about their own revolution and the French talk about theirs. I do think that the English should talk a little more about the fact that A, 
we killed our king first. And then B, you know, we, we express some of these very, very radical ideas very early on. It seems an absolute crime that we don't talk about it more. And so I took the opportunity in the book to do it. But really, it is a key part of that process. Um, and one that I think more liberal theory should probably fold in. I, I, was, I was delighted you did. I mean, in part because I think it is the great period of English history. Mm. Um, I should declare an interest that I am a member of the Cromwell Association of all things. Oh, wow. Uh, and if anybody ever goes to Huntingdon, do go to the Cromwell Museum in Huntingdon, which is, you know, a real insight into the period. And it's not just about Oliver Cromwell, we haven't been born in Huntingdon. So, you know, I thought that bit for me, and you are absolutely right about the link between uh, the English Revolution and the American Revolution, in that many of the American revolutionaries borrowed the language of the English Civil War and the levelers to write their own constitution. It's also the only time we had a written constitution and the only time this country has been run by a mod, by a commoner. It's mm -hmm. worth remembering that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're all plus points for me. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> 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 uh, I mean, I guess the other thing, and you, you've kind of touched on this with the, with the quote from, from Overton there, is that one of the other themes in the book, it seems to me, is the relationship between the individual and the state. Um, and I just wondered what you think is the right relationship and, and how actually to go with that, does each develop a mutual trust in the other? Because if I hand my some responsibilities over the, to the state as an individual, I expect the state to look after me in return. So what's that, what's that level of trust that we should be looking for, do you think? Well, it's, to be honest, it's immaterial to me how much the state does or does not trust us. The state is there at our discretion, we allow it to exist in the form that it takes. Only the individual matters, and the state only matters insofar as it is working for the individual. So that's right there in the beating heart of Locke's philosophy. When I was younger, I used to avoid Locke all the time because I thought it was boring. And the funny thing is, you read Locke, I mean, it's not fun to read, and I'm not going to pretend that it's fun to read Locke, but um, it is profoundly radical stuff. You know, under Locke's idea is that the state is there to adjudicate in disputes between individuals. It's set up for that reason, that it makes us all more free by virtue of adjudicating so that we don't end up in a sort of, you know, tougher sky winds competition. Now, the moment that it is not fulfilling that function, it is an illegitimate state. The moment it steps outside of its legal bounds, the moment that it is not there to help the individual. It is stepping outside of its bounds, and you have a right of revolution against it. I mean, to be honest, the radical you get the radicalism of Locke by virtue of, you know, if you were to take an unlawful prorogation of parliament, for instance, like that committed by our prime minister, technically under Lockean philosophy, you have a right of revolution against that guy. You, you get to overthrow that guy. And that, that, that is a conservative reading of John Locke. That would be what he, he would propose. And it is extremely liberal in that respect. You, you then get... Um, a slight change, because for most of liberal history, you just get this complete opposition to the state. The state is the threat. The state has to be brought under control. It's a threat against individual liberties and needs to be shrunk down. And then I think the big change comes with Harriet Taylor and John Stuart Mill. Um, and that's a view that the state isn't only a threat. It's also an opportunity. The state can also create greater freedoms. And it does that by interfering where freedoms are limited, and it does that by diverting resources so that people who have a very poor material life, who, for instance, have a very insecure situation with their rent or something or, 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 or insufficient education, um, can have those opportunities provided by the activity of the state. So you then get a more complex view, but at all points, its actions are mediated by the demand for individual freedom. So it's not a, it's not a symbiotic relationship that the state is our servant and it only is legitimate insofar as it is protecting and encouraging individual freedom. Okay, I think actually this, the question I've just was monitoring the chat there, and, and I think there's a question that's come in that actually goes in, the, in this territory, which is the state that you just said is, is, is one thing, but the state is actually constructed of various parts um, itself and, and one important part of that is actually the court and the judicial system. Um, 
So the question that's come in here is, is what role do you see the courts playing going forward? The proposed intrusion slash dismantling of the separation of powers is dangerous. Uh, this has come from a solicitor. As a solicitor, I know our profession is horrified. But the use of emotive language, um, sorry, it's just disappeared. I like the courts going being out of touch is the populist part. Imagine if a proposal follows through a government without checks by an independent judiciary. Do you want to say a little bit about where you think the yeah. judiciary fits in all of this? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this is key, you know, really early on in the liberal story, you get this idea of power is dangerous, the state is dangerous, you've got to start separating power out. And so you separate, I mean, it's Montesquieu is a classic on this, but I would say, you know, the first time you really see a program for the separation of powers is with the rev is with the revelers. That makes them sound much more fun than they were as Puritans, <laughs> is with the levelers. Um, uh, in the case of the army truly stated, I think. Um, where you start saying, well, look, fine, so we're going to take this bit, we're going to put this bit over here. And of course, any campaign for parliament is about the separation of powers. The judiciary really comes into its own with Montesquieu and, of course, um, later on, the, the American Constitution. And um, what's incredible is when you look across at the right wing populists in any country, no matter what their distinctions, you know, whether you're looking at Brazil, whether you're looking at the US or Hungary or Italy or the UK, you see an attack on the separation of powers. You see an attack on parliament. You always see an attack on the, on the press, or at least the part of the press that's critical. And you pretty much always see an attack on the judiciary. Now, Orban, who's kind of the totemic figure for this, managed to pretty much gut the Hungarian judiciary. I mean, he did it actually in a very savvy legal way, but he basically got rid of the kind of slight older judges who might be prepared to stand up to the government and replaced them with Fidesz loyalists. Fidesz is his party. And um, here we've seen a sustained attack. Um, of, I mean, you know, we all know the Article 50 case, the, you know, enemies of the people, blah, 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 blah. And um, we then saw that translated after the last Supreme Court case, the Lady Hale case, um, on prorogation, into the judicial review reforms um, under Buckland. Now, I, I was surprised by um, actually how kind of defanged the judicial review reforms were. I thought they were going to be much worse than they came across. Certainly that was the impression you got by the kind of rhetoric that was going around first. But in actual fact, predominantly, I mean, they weren't great, but, you know, they were concerning immigration cases. There was very little to get rid of judicial review as a direct challenge towards ministerial decision making. And um, they were quite step by step. Now, I suspect a lot of that is to do with the fact that it was Buckland. And Buckland was a reluctant populist you know he was probably the most moderate of them and so obviously they got rid of him um, and we now have Rob so the, the next round of judicial review attacks may be rather less literate and rather less uh, moderate we'll have to wait and see the second prong of course in the attacks of, of what Rob would do will probably be the human rights act or certainly that's the attack that we expect to come it's hard to say at the moment because we just haven't seen the content I, you know I was I spent a year over a year thinking these judicial review reforms are going to be brutal, uh, probably worse than what we saw on the grayling. It turned out they were much more moderate than that. So it's it's not clear right now uh, exactly which way Rob is going to turn. We have to wait and see on that. I mean, I suppose the other thing is that, of course, those countries that you were referring to, and I was thinking also of the American Supreme Court uh, in that, our, our judges have not tended to be, I'm sure they have political views, but they've not tended to be political appointees in that sense. Um, and as long as that separation between the law, the, the legal system and the parliamentary system remains in place, you know, there will be some fight back from judges when they feel they're being imposed upon by politicians of right or left, I guess. There is, although, I mean, politicians have been very, very quick in this country to brand judges overly political. And in fact, that's been a a pretty key aspect of sort of what were used to be called Eurosceptic circles and the kind of debates you'd see in Eurosceptic, you know, judicial overreach, whether it was from Europe, but also domestically. And um, I, I think most of that doesn't really stack up. Like, I mean, you look at the Supreme Court, it seems to me that every time it reaches a decision, everyone acts like this is the entirety of its attitude towards government. So you get the prorogation decision and everyone says, oh, look, the Supreme Court, it's really tough against government. They're trying to, they're a campaigning court. Then you get the the um, uh, the Vega case, and suddenly everyone's like, "Oh, look, the Supreme Court is like this puppy of, of government," and and you know, 
it will just do whatever it's told. I mean, most of the time, it, it, it's a pretty independent-minded court. It very often, more often than not, rules in favour of government. It's quite cautious in that quite classic sort of judicial way of not wanting to step too far in political decision making. Um, but I don't think that that has necessarily been a safeguard to you know being attacked because with this government, anyone that is speaking in a different kind of politics, whether it's BBC or judges or anyone else, will be talked about as if they're part of a conspiracy against the government, when in fact they're simply exercising their independent judgment. I mean, I guess one of the other th things that comes out, and I'm, I'm getting one or two questions in this territory, which I think is, is, is intriguing, is, you know, having spent a long time in the book going through the kind of intellectual history of, of liberalism, some of which you vaguely knew, you, I, a reader, vaguely knew, some of which I'd never even heard of, um, so, you know, for, for pub trivia quiz questions, there's a real, you know, glut in the, in, in the book. And I don't say that as a, as a joke. I mean, it's quite fascinating how much reading you've done. At the end, obviously, there's more a question to us as readers, which is, OK, how do we go forward? How do we fight back, if you like? Um, and you used the phrase earlier about, you know, perhaps liberals are now the barbarians at the gate. Perhaps liberals are going to be the disruptors which the populists have been over the last decade. Well, there's a question here from Emma and Tom, which is what international examples of liberalism can we draw on to inform the how-to? Um, and are there any contemporary ones that we could look at? Um, uh, and uh, there's also another one, which is about the importance of narrative over fact. And I think that's a, a criticism one could level at the current government. Um, given the power of narrative of, over fact, what lessons do we need to learn in opposing those who govern us while govern us while gaslighting us or denying or obfuscating facts? Okay, there's a two, I mean, okay, so let's take them in turn. Um, on the first, I think you see these examples around you all the time. You know, I think, I mean, look at, look at where we are right now with uh, women's safety, as I'm separating that out from the rest of the feminist debate, women's safety really since the police attack on the demonstration and the manner in which that's now discussed. And look at how that, where that, how that operates as a movement. Okay, so you have people on the streets operating in quite dangerous conditions with attacks by the police. And yet you also have a sort of more moderate front, um, a more mainstream front is probably a better, a better term, that has led to, I mean, you know, take a look at the Tory party conference, right? You have no reactionary statement is too much during those few days. And yet, what was the one thing they suddenly felt they wouldn't go anywhere on? Violence against women. From Boris Johnson, Sajid Javid, all the way down, all of them felt, no, no, I have to say, you know, the violence against women thing is a problem we're dealing with. So what you're seeing there is an effective campaign that, can op that operates not just by virtue of people on the street, people campaigning on the street, but also by virtue of mainstream party political politics. Um, and it, at the moment, is working. These things are slow. It doesn't mean that everything's okay in one go, but it means you have the momentum of political change behind you. I think you can say the same thing about Black Lives Matter. It's crucial in all of these things that you have these cultural kind of communication beacons. In that case, in this country, it was the England football team, something you wouldn't have presumed is of absolutely crucial importance. And again, you see mainstream campaigning together with street-based campaigning. Now, these are examples that we use now. I mean, it doesn't mean you have to get the government out. The best thing that can happen, of course, for the triumph of liberalism in this country is to get rid of this government. But you can do good, decent, important work while these governments are in power. And I think you don't even need to look overseas, though there are good examples overseas. You can look to your own country and, and see how effective that is. Um, on the second question, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put the binary as narrative um, versus fact. And in fact, I, I, I sort of think that our problem often is that we don't use enough narrative in the manner in which you communicate. You can insert fact into narrative. You can insert feeling as well, by the way. I mean, you know, just because the emphasis entirely on emotion is wrong doesn't mean that it isn't useful to have some passion about you and that that wasn't something that we really, frankly, were lacking beforehand. I mean, I think that the key is you have to be able to tell people a story, you know, about their own lives, about how it improves, about the country that you live in. And if you can't tell that story, you're going to lose. So really, the narrative part needs to be retained. What I think it is, is it comes down to being able to speak simply about things in cogent terms. Now, my experience, I spend most of my life 
talking to experts about things that I barely understand and they tell me how it works and I translate it. My experience talking to experts is the people who really, really get something can speak about it in simple language. The ones who can't quite, who are nervous, who, who feel like they're just grasping onto their understanding of it, use very, very technical, complicated language. Really, you just have to understand something well enough to use a simple language about it, whether that comes down to international institutions or the manner in which inflation works or the reasons that um, creating labor shortages won't actually improve wages in society. You just have to be able to speak in simple language. And that comes by virtue of understanding the situation very well. That's how you defeat their lives. Not by thinking we go entirely into narrative and not by thinking we go entirely into fact. It is harnessing both of those things by virtue of your understanding of the objective reality that we face. I think that's, uh, while, you were, while you were answering that, the references to you know, the experts, the, the best experts being able to summarize and tell their expertise in language that ordinary people will understand. Um, and I was just kind of reminded of George Orwell's wonderful essays on politics and the English language. Yeah. You know, that if you can't explain it easily and properly to people, the person on the Clapham on the bus, the person you've got 20 seconds with in the lift, then, you know, you ought not to be trying to do it because your message will just not get through. And that is about understanding the person that you're the, the, the lived experience of the person that you're speaking to, as well as your own lived experience, isn't it? It is. You know, I think journalists are quite uniquely well disposed towards doing this, or they should be. Certainly when I you know, became a journalist, I was just this poncy, pretentious political radical. And I would I remember the first article I did was just like one paragraph, I think. And someone had to sit down with me and be like, no. We write them in more than one paragraph. They have to be written. Um, and I was told, you know, quite early on, was something that was very, um, who I'm very grateful to now for, having, for telling me that, was, you know, you're not a novelist. You know, you're not writing in a fountain pen. Your job is to communicate information as quickly and easily and hopefully entertainingly as possible to someone that's on a bus, putting onto a handrail, is late for a meeting and is just about to give you 80 seconds of their attention. That's your job. I think one of the problems that we've had with some journalists, not all by any stretch, and I'm, I, I tend to get a bit sort of tired of, of how much people like attacking journalists, and that doesn't seem the best target, is um, that there's a kind of despair, especially around producers on radio and TV, about um, how much information they think people are able to take. So you'll get this sort of this surrender, this idea, well, they just won't understand me, the, you know, the, the reality of trade tariffs or something so we, we don't have to, you know we'll just make it a since you will make it a soap opera and just and just let it be a he said she said well though really what what that really comes down to is as an operational decision is you go let's pass it over to Millbank. Millbank being you know the politics part of for instance the bbc you just go give it to the politics guys not give it to the trade expert guys not give it to the economics editor you know not give it to the legal editor just turn it into a Millbank story now that is i mean not just a sort of I think an act of disrespect towards the audience and its desire for information. What I found over and over, um, excuse the beeping, but apparently my washing machine just finished. Um, what I find over and over is that people are keen for information. They want to understand how the world works. It's also a betrayal of the audience because they're unable to function as democratic citizens by virtue of being given decent information about the way in which their country works. So I think that, that really is the problem with journalists. It's not the skill it's the confidence in the public, and that needs to be fixed really rather quickly. I've got a, a question here, just changing the subject completely, but I think it's, it, again, it's a timely one. Um, and it's about what should the liberal, with a big L or a small L, uh, attitude be towards COVID passports on the basis of you know, protection of the individual by the state? Um, the person said, you know, tonight, a close friend from Italy has been told that they'll only get employment if they've got a COVID passport. So, you know, what's what, what would be a liberal skeptic with that true sense of skepticism approach mm -hmm. to the COVID passport question? Yeah, so, I mean, this is one, of, it's a really good question. This is one of those issues that um, you're not gonna find one liberal opinion on. So I would, it, you, you could compare it maybe to uh, the ban on smoking in public places would be another example of really where the, the liberal arguments will take you in quite different directions. 
to give you an impression of that, I was opposed to the smoking ban and then later became quite supportive of it. Um, I think with COVID, with vaccine passports, um, I've seen quite a split in the liberal people that I know. I'm opposed to them. Very many liberal minded people I know are for them. Um, I would make distinctions based on several criteria. For a start, they're not in the abstract against liberal principles. Liberalism has an idea in it called the harm principle. And that's that you are entitled to interfere in the freedom of others where their behavior may harm someone else. Okay? So of course, if someone is you know, shouting at a crowd, let's all murder this guy, you are entitled to take away their free speech. You know, that is not an infringement of liberalism. That is just working towards the harm principle. And we've just spent you know, nearly two years of our lives locked up inside without the right to leave the house in order to protect other people from harm. That is the harm principle. So you take COVID vaccines and you could probably pass it, but you would want to know certain pieces of information. You'd want to know what is the degree of vaccine skepticism in the country and how much is a lack of uptake on vaccines to do with that as opposed to do with supply of vaccines. You would want to know how effective is this kind of policy towards getting vaccine skeptic people to take the vaccine. You would want to know what are the IT systems that are behind the passport if it is implemented by the state and where is that information being shared? Because of course the barrier that you're crossing is you are required, <coughs> you're requiring someone to have undertaken a medical procedure before they can enter a certain area, whether it's a job or, or, or an entertainment venue. So that's quite a step to have taken. You want to know where that information is being shared. You want to know how many spaces it applies to. If it was all restaurants, all supermarkets, all workplaces, you would be saying that we're essentially freezing you out of civil society until you take this thing. If it was just concert halls and football matches, you might take a different view. So all of these factors get brought in. Now, let me say something important. Liberalism always does this. It always gets bogged down, and I mean that in a good way, in detail and case-by-case -case decision making and the, the cautious balancing of rights. That is what it always gets into. And that's one of the reasons that some people find it very uninspiring. You know, to them, they just think, well, I want a man the barricades. I need simple answers and I want change now. Well, no, actually, well, liberalism cannot promise you that. What it will say is we're going to work our way through this carefully to make sure that we're emphasizing the freedom of the individual. It's not satisfying, but it has the considerable advantage of abiding by the rights of the individual and by empirical truth. So on that basis, I would say that it would be the smart way to go. But you won't find two liberals agreeing on this issue. And in fact, some of the fiercest liberal debates I've had for the last three months have concerned this exact issue. I mean, that's a very interesting and an important point about the liberal with liberal approach in terms of fact, content, analysis, research. And I think you are very fair, I hope you won't mind me saying this, in the book, in your analysis both of John Maynard Keynes and of Friedrich Hayek. Mm. Um, now, they were kind of polar opposites in terms, I guess, of the political outcomes that they were looking for. And most of us, you know, associate Hayek with Thatcher and Keynes with the Attlee government, but you rightly say that Keynes was, was an old school liberal primarily. Do you want to say a little bit about that, that tension, if you like, between the, the laissez-faire liberal, if you like, I think is the phrase you use in the case of Hayek, and the radical liberal, uh, as you describe Keynes? Yeah, they're, they're funny. You know, they were friends as well. They were genuine friends. And there is, um, they were friends all their life, really. I mean, they argued all the time and, they were very, and their disciples were very vitriolic against each other. And there are, you can find these copies of, of Hayek's articles in the books that, that Keynes has scribbled over. And his scribbles are extremely abusive. You know, he comes in, right, like the wildest Farrago of nonsense yet. And, you know, this is an example of how is, is it a logician following his principles, but on wrong premises would end up in bedlam. It, he's very abusive in the comments. Um, but they were friends. There is one night actually during the Second World War where they're both on the roof, um, I think in Cambridge. Um, sort of tasked with if any incendiaries fall on the roof, they have to brush them off. And there is, so there is this moment that Keynes and I sat on the, I, I do so wish someone would write the play that clearly needs to be written, that is set on that Cambridge rooftop with Keynes and I spending the evening together. Um, 
and Hayek is a decent man. He is, he's not a bad guy. Um, he is in my mind catastrophically wrong. And th there is a moral failing to him in the end that I think speaks volumes about the moral failing of that form of liberalism. This form of liberalism, you know, has an old heritage, just as old as radical liberalism. I mean, it's essentially to say, first of all, what is the freedom of the individual? Surely that means we don't take your stuff. You keep your property. So we're going to have minimal taxation. Secondly, that by virtue of doing that, of allowing the individual to behave freely economically, we increase productivity, we increase society's material life as a whole, and we all become richer. This is essentially the invisible hand argument from Adam Smith. So the state should stay out of the way of the market of individuals' economic behavior. Um, and that also means really that the state shouldn't be regulating things too much. You know, whatever it does, the market will regulate better. Now, take bank regulation. Like if you look at what was happening to the banks in Germany before the Nazis came in, okay, that is a failure of bank regulation. And you can make the very cogent and I think extremely convincing argument that were it not for that failure of bank regulation, you would probably not get the rise of the Nazis. Certainly, electorally, that is the dynamic you can mostly see. Now, take what happened during the financial crash now. Uh, now, this shows my age, you know, over a decade ago, <laughs> in 2008. Um, what do you see? You see, again, in the lead up to it, those same arguments by Anne Greenspan, etc. You know, say, oh, the market will regulate itself. The market did not regulate itself. You know, when it came to credit rating agencies, slapping AAA ratings on investment assets uh, made up of mortgages that then they used to secure liquidity on the repo markets and that bottomed out when it turned out that those assets were without value and hadn't been properly appreciated. Who was paying those credit rating agencies? The banks to whom they were giving the rating. A clear conflict of interest, an insane conflict of interest, one so insane in fact, that I, could have, I had to speak to three ex experts before I believed that it could possibly be true. That is what market regulation gets you. And what did it do? It detonated our economy. And it is one of, not the only one, but it's one of the reasons that led to the rise of populism in the era that we're living in now. So to me, that Hayek view has always been a catastrophe. The other view by Keynes has this heritage, same sort of place as Locke, Adam Smith, but is best expressed, funnily enough, by uh, John Stuart Mill. Not Harriet Taylor in this case, his wife. She was his co-partner for much of the work, but not for this. And um, when he said the question of the state versus the market admits of no universal solution. And that was to say that in, there are no areas that only the market should do it, and there's no areas that only the state should do it. When you look at utilities, when you look at restaurants, when you look at capital. Uh, something's frozen here. Something's frozen. Is it me or is it you? Hello? It's I here. can still hear you, Rob. Can you? So it must yeah. be. I think it's you. Sorry, Ian, I think you went partway through that rant. It's the laissez-faire liberals are trying to silence me through the medium of Plusnet. <laughs> this, is what, this is what has happened. Oh, sorry. Well, anyway, yeah, the, yeah, the John Maynard Keynes thing is, is another approach that sees that you interfere in the market. And this is a crucial economic distinction in, in liberalism, an absolutely crucial one. To me, if there is a future to liberalism, if it survives the battle that it's in right now, it is by committing to that radical Keynesian approach to economics. And it's very interesting that you you picked up the the banking crisis as being a contribution to the rise of populism. I mean, that's certainly, you know, I've I've always felt that there were, in addition to the Brexit vote, there was the banking crisis where nobody seemed to be punished, apart from people who didn't have money in the first place, and MPs' expenses, and those three coming together have led to the rise of the populist politics. Of, of Farage and Johnson. No, uh, is that fair or? Yeah, I mean, I would add, I would add to that list. I think that there's a crisis of confidence in institutions. And I think you can add to that, you know, the phone hacking scandal, um, you, know, you can look at the stuff that's happened at the BBC and, and ultimately where that gets you is um, a lack of confidence in experts that they are actually talking about objective reality. And that was, heavily weaponized by Cummings during the 2016 referendum, and not just by Cummings, by Michael Gove as well, and obviously by Boris Johnson, to try and make you think that any statement of objective reality that contradicted their views had to come from a conspiracy from global elites. 
And so, yeah, the bedding is there and it's in those, those kind of domino effects in British politics of crises of confidence in institutions. But of course, you, you do see that around the world. This happens to be our sort of domestic setup, but you see a very, very similar process taking place around the world. So, I mean, so it's one of the other things that, that the populist politician plays on is a sense of patriotism, mm -hmm. leading actually in many cases to a sense of nationalism rather than patriotism. Do you, it, it, is there a, a possibility of a liberal patriotism? Oh yeah, of course. If, if so, what, what do you think it would look, what does it look like? I mean, okay, well, let, let me talk. The first thing I should say about that question, and we talk about this a lot on the sort of podcast that I do, of, you know, what is progressive patriotism? Is I always think it's a bit weird when we even talk about it because it's, you know, patriotism is your love of country. You can have it or you cannot have it. Doesn't, there's no judgment either way. Um, but it's sort of, it always strikes, because I do have it, I do actually love my country, and I, it always strikes me as sort of like if someone was to sit down and go, how, why do you love your, explain the way in which you love your wife, <laughs> you sort of think, like, well, this is a very strange question, I, if, if someone was doing that on a daily basis, you think, well, maybe, maybe you don't love your wife, it's a very strange thing for you to be saying. Um, so I sort of think, you know, the first thing about liberal patriotism is you just do it, you either feel it or you don't, and you can express it if you like, there's certainly nothing wrong with it. And there's certainly no obligation to feel it. And um, the best person for this to me is Isaiah Berlin. And Isaiah Berlin was, in, in his words, I'm a Jew from Riga. And I've lived in England all my life. And I love it very much. But I am a Jew from Riga. And that is how I've lived. And that is how I will die. He fitted in in England terribly well. And he loved England. But he always knew, he always felt like there was something slightly distant between him and the country. And that, I think, allowed him to write with extraordinary grace and maturity about what belonging was. Really, that's what really mattered to him. It wasn't really quite patriotism. Language played a huge role for him. It was all about, as he put it, I must be able to make myself understood and to be understood in response. He was obsessed with little sort of tricks of language that denote a shared identity. I mean, one of them would be something like cheers mate. You know, if you, if you say cheers mate, you know, it means nothing here. You know, when I've been away from sort of England for months on end, and I bump into it to a Brit or something, and someone says, cheers, mate. It, it is music to my soul, because I know what I'm dealing with there. Um, and that really, to him, was the crucial thing about um, Berlin's view of this, was that belonging mattered not in and of itself. It matters because it matters to the individual. That's why I managed to live, because it matters to the individual. So what is that patriotism? What is that sense of belonging? Whether it's a town or a continent or a football club or whatever, it is mediated by freedom. It's plural, it's diverse. It's a personal love story that you have with the places that you do feel something for, that you do feel belonging in, and is not something homogenous to be imposed on you from above. For instance, when people say, will of the people, and these guys are not the people, that is a completely barren, brutalized, bruising form of belonging that seeks to exclude. This is the belonging that seeks to include and that you can express or not. So to me, I, I just, I never think that it's so complex and we will use it or we will not use it and we will talk about it or we will not talk about it. But it is certainly crucial to understand that there is no barrier between liberalism and love of country. There never has been, you know, it has simply never existed. And we do well to just speak very openly and plainly about the things we like and dislike about our country without worrying that we're going to be sort of isolated as elitist, metropolitan, rootless, cosmo, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Citizens of nowhere, as Citizens Theresa of... May put it. Yes. Um, I mean, I guess that that's another, another sort of strand in what you're talking about is whether it's possible to have a rational discussion about issues like this in a world of the social media where everybody's shouting at each other or if they're not shouting at each other they're shouting in an echo chamber and they're only talking to people they know and love and like um the kind of world that you're describing is a much more of the, the kind of the greek city state where we perhaps debate these things with each other in the in the cafe over a coffee or a glass of wine <laughs> i'm being unfair to you yeah, I think so. Um, you need to know what the forum is that you're using. 
you know. Um, and I think we all know that intuitively, you know. You know, we, we know, we know what it is to argue with, you know, your father-in-law at Christmas or with your friends in the pub. And we have a different approach towards these two sort of scenarios. Um, Twitter isn't very good uh, for having arguments. Uh, no social media is really, Twitter's particularly bad. Um, I mean, partly because it's so visible um, and you feel that you have to represent your tribe and partly because it essentially has a scoring system by virtue of the like function. You know, the one with the most likes wins. And that, that is not what you want for a healthy intellectual debate. So, but there are good things that come from Twitter. I mean, Twitter is one of those places. I mean, I, I learn more by being on Twitter than I would by reading all the magazines that are available in my local news agent because I can follow experts. I can follow people that know what they're talking about. And incidentally, I can also follow people that make me laugh every day. Laughter is a really undervalued quality when things get quite bleak in politics. So you get something from it, but you have to know what it can achieve and what it can't. You will never see me having an argument on Twitter. Now, I do not do it because it is not the forum for that place. I go in and I shout my mouth off and I'm, I'm, I might be quite aggressive in the politics that I express, but I'm not having debates because that is not the forum for it. Off Twitter, you do have those debates and you can have them in town halls. You often do. You can have them in TV and radio. You have them across the dinner table. You have them in the pub. You have them everywhere. But to me, Social media is not designed for that. In fact, it's quite dangerous when we use it for that. So it is not the forum for it. And, and rather than, it's possible that one day the social media companies will take more of a social responsibility about the algorithms that they use. Until they do, I would suggest that we stop thinking of it as a forum for that kind of exchange of ideas. That is not what it is very good at. And in fact, quite the opposite. It's extremely pernicious for it. Okay. I'm going to throw you the one final the devil's advocate question which is the mm -hmm. one you always get at the end of the radio interview or the tv interview isn't it really i get them all the way through well um, <laughs> okay well you know just I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate but you know a reader i think might comment on the lack of both female and non-white figures in in your book overall um i mean millicent Fawcett gets a bit part laying the wreath to John Stuart Mill's grave. Um, she mentioned twice on, on one page, I think. Um, I, I know this is not your doing, but Harriet Taylor, to whom you've referred, who is given an index in, entry under her married name. So it says, under Har Harriet Taylor, it says, see under Mill. It's quite interesting. Why are all your liberals white men? Well, I mean, let's briefly, I'll get to the, the substance of that, of that point um, in a moment. But let's deal with the Harriet Taylor thing. I mean, I think in terms of indexing, I don't know how indexing works. Um, I presume that there is a system you use by which you use the legal name that they had when they died. So, of course, she had a husband before she got married to John Stewart now. Um, it's not the name I use for her in the book, uh, in, the, in the text. But that isn't really for, I mean, the main reason for that is because I'm constantly talking about them using their surnames. And I don't want to put Mill and Mill said, it sounds preposterous, so I say Mill and Taylor. Um, I mean, I would say on the day, I, I'm unaware of any other book on liberalism or on John Stuart Mill that's given such a heavy role to her and that has put her in what I think is her rightful place as the mother of liberalism. So I do think I'm, I'm fairly well covered in, in that respect. And um, you know what's funny is, when I was writing the book, I kept on... No, let me start with this. Um, you kind of can't fight the oppression of history. And one of the things that the oppression of history does is it doesn't just silence people in their own time. It silences them into the future. So when we look at the bits of writing we see from the leveler wise, we see a really quite cogent, quite powerful uh, political campaign. Um, for instance, that porosity that is an England speech there is an early variation of it that comes from John Lilburn's wife when she's petitioning in Parliament for his release. Um, and so very early on, I started sort of stuffing it because I was very aware of this kind of criticism, stuffing it with these sort of examples wherever you could find someone. And the trouble is, for instance, we only see the level of wives insofar as it affects the men. All of the communication we hear from them is when they're trying to get their husbands free, pretty much in every single case, because no one bothered to write down what they were saying the rest of the time. That's the tyranny of history. That's how it silences people in the ages that go on. Now, you can try and fight against it, but what you end up doing 
is just creating this kind of, um, you don't have the empirical evidence with which to insert it. So you just sort of bloat it out with stuff that is essentially you trying to cater to your own guilt <laughs> about, about history, which doesn't really get you too far. You have to accept that part. I think that the bigger criticism of the book would be, you know, what about the sort of liberal thinkers in the 20th century when finally we were listening to people from different backgrounds, um, and especially women. For instance, I'd like to have had Nussbaum in there, who's probably one of the most impressive sort of liberal women uh, philosophers. Um, but the truth is, by that point, you're just like, this is a big book, and you are trying to follow through on a through line, and to insert people because of your guilt, rather than because of the argument, puts you in a, in a quite dangerous position. So you kind of have to accept history as it is. It's not great, it doesn't make you very happy, but that is the story that was told by virtue of the silencing. And now we're left with that silenced version of history. The most you can do is to be aware of it. But beyond that, you're kind of in a hiding to nothing if you try and find voices that have already been silenced right to your narrative because they are not there to be found. Thank you, Ian. Um, perfectly fair and good answer. And just forgive Great me for question. asking the question. Um, I know that I know that Litfest has also put in the chat already um, a reference to the other events that are happening during the course of this autumn. Um, Dave Wakeley, do you want to say anything specifically now? Now's your chance. Hi, Rob. Thank you. Uh, I was also going to hold up to the camera for those of us who've been following this wonderful discussion. Uh, get yourself to Waterstones and, and get yourself a copy of Ian's book. It really is a fantastic, fascinating read. And let me quickly run through some of the other events we have coming up. Uh, at Litfest this autumn. Uh, our next event is next Thursday when we have a writing workshop with Charlie Hill, a uh, novelist, memoirist and short story writer from Birmingham uh, about putting poetry into your prose. Uh, this is a workshop I've taken part in with Charlie previously and I thoroughly recommend. He's a very thoughtful, very perceptive writer and a, a very diligent workshop leader. Uh, so Definitely worth, worth your time if you are a writer uh, and there are only limited places. The following Friday, the 29th of October, we have uh, an event called Exiles on Main Street, two emerging writers. Uh, Jonathan Pizarro, who is a Gibraltarian writer, uh, now based in London, and Gomush Noor, uh, who is uh, an Iranian poet and short story writer, also now based in London. Uh, both of them young gay writers talking about their experience of living in exile and their experience as young gay people moving from one very unsupportive environment to an ostensibly more liberal one, but one that's more complicated by <coughs> their non-native status, uh, something that Jonathan writes about very perceptively. Uh, on the 3rd of November, we have a poetry workshop with the Irish poet Sean Hewitt uh, called Queer Natures, which draws a lot on the, the thinking of John Carpenter. Uh, Sean Hewitt also recently won the Laurel Prize for Eco Poetry. Uh, again, I can recommend that one as somebody that's sat in several of Sean's workshops previously. Uh, the following Thursday, we have a nature writing workshop with Emma Decent. Um, which I know uh, several of us who are of an environmental and, and nature-loving bent are very much looking forward to. On the 18th of November, we have uh, Professor Kath Green. Kath is one of the two creators of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, and uh, co-author of the book Vaxxers. Uh, and she will be talking to the Deputy Director of Public Health for Milton Keynes, Oliver Mitten, uh, about the book, uh, which takes you through the extraordinary story of the incredibly accelerated development of the vaccine, but also of the hurdles that she and Sarah Gilbert had to tackle in terms of politicians' uh, relationship to science and expertise, to vaccine hesitancy, and uh, having listened to Kath speak at, at uh, Cheltenham Let First recently online, the ongoing struggles that they have in continuing to get funding, funding not only for modifications to the vaccine, but also for work against 
for work on vaccines against other serious illnesses, which is dwindling as all the money gets thrown at the initial development of the vaccine that we already have. Uh, a fascinating, fascinating room, and definitely somebody speaking in the capacity as a horse's mouth for once, rather than as, as an opinion maker. And uh, then on the 2nd of De December, we have uh, Sarah Pimbra, uh, one of Milton Keynes' probably more notable residents, uh, the author of Behind Her Eyes and Dead to Her, both international bestsellers, which Sarah is, is now developing for Netflix as televised serialisations. All of the all of those are available listed on the festival website at mklitfest.org as further information on all the events and links through to Book a Place. So please take yourself there and have a damn good read. Thanks very much, Dave. And again, Ian, thank you for being here tonight. I wish we were in the same room because uh, now we could have a glass of wine or a bottle of beer or whatever. Thank you for racing back despite the tube breakdown in your taxi and getting here perfectly on time. And I can see from the comments in the chat box and the questions we've had from the public that everybody's really enjoyed themselves. So uh, if you want to unmute yourselves and clap in, you can, because now's the chance, but I'm going to anyway. Ian, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to thank not only Ian for a scintillating evening. I do notice that uh, uh, the audience stayed riveted until we started to run through our future programme, but nearly everybody is still there. <laughs> thank you also to, to Rob for some some uh, very diligent and, and effective questioning. I thought we got a really good idea of the Ian Dunt that I follow on Twitter assiduously. So uh, thank both of you for entertaining us all. And thank you, the audience, for um, being uh, so engaged and coming out and supporting MK LitFest. Uh, we'd, we'd like to build an audience. We are uh, hoping to get back to face-to-face -to -face, uh, LitFest activity for 2022. So uh, we're hoping to uh, do in 2022 what we did in 2017, 18 and 19, which would be a, an intensive weekend. But one thing that COVID has taught us is that uh, the online programme that we're doing and that Dave just went through uh, has a, a very, a very strong um, <clears throat> ethos. And it's, a, it's a, certainly something that we will be continuing uh, in parallel with the occasional live events. So we look forward to seeing you in person. Uh, thank you all very much for your time, and especially thank you, Ian. Lived up to our hopes. <laughs> so that ends the uh, the evening's proceedings, and we will watch you leave. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's really great. It's like sitting in the bath with the plug out as the water <laughs> trickles away. <laughs> Which is actually a delightful feeling, and so equally, it's it's something very soothing about watching the the audience trickle away. <laughs> and thank you for those who came in for a while. I think, um, Kasia, are you f uh, coming in from yeah. from Poland? And I think, Ree, were you were you in Wales? Somebody said they were in Wales. So we have an international audience. <laughs> thank you, Ian, for bringing an international audience to our to grace our time. <laughs>